idea that the care giving at those sites is exactly the same as the one giving at St. Jude with every aspect. Below that will be members, and I think most of the centers will fall in this category, and the members are side that can do most of the treatment. Maybe they will need to refer limb salvage or brain surgery to the core members because of their expertise, uh, but then they take the patients back to continue the treatment. And then the associate member could be members, let's say, in Yemen or currently in Iraq or Libya to where the infrastructure is so poor, and they will be required just to contribute to a registry so that we understand their needs. And those are fluid because there will be required so people can go up, hopefully not down, so an associate can, our goal is to make the associate become a member and the member become a core member, and those are not walls to divide or judge the center, they are actually to make us help those center better on how to get better. So when we talk about cancer, and this was mentioned this morning, what is cancer? Uh, registries are available in very few countries, and when they are available many times, they are not very correct, or they speak different languages before because of the data corrected. So our first priority, now that we got approval in March, is to move with a global registry. So we have a database at St. Jude, and this database will be shared with all our global sites, uh, and we will start a registry collecting the minimal details that we need in order to advance and know how to uh, help the care in the region. So this will be diagnosis, treatment, outcome, and cost. And you know many times we talk about cost being cheap somewhere and expensive somewhere, and we don't want to, the cost to be high, but we don't want the cost to be very low, but then nobody is surviving. So this is the balance to where you cannot judge how much you're helping the patient if you don't have all this equation and then you decide how you are dispersing the funds, not dispersing in the way of spending it, but how you are directing the funds, directing the training, and improving the outcome at every level. Parallel to that, with the same database, there will be protocol creation and database collection on a specific protocol. And currently we are starting with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The reason it is the most common leukemia, and then it's the uh, most easiest to treat without all the subspecialty, and it will affect the most children. So now the medical directors of every region are reviewing what the region is doing, and we are meeting together at St. Jude to kind of comb through everything that's being done. Uh, we don't think we will go to the one protocol globally soon. I think it will take a washout period to where we will modify the protocol to come closer to what we think is the best for children with leukemia. But then later, I hope in five years, there will be a one protocol, which is the treatment that we feel is the best. However, it will come in three tiers, one, two, three. And the higher tier will be to centers that have molecular diagnostics, cytogenetics, uh, and all the sophisticated treatment, and we feel that this protocol will be exactly what we are using at St. Jude. Then will be another one, the lower tier, in countries where even immunophenotype is not available and abandonment is high, and we will start by, okay, let's just follow the outcome of those patients, make sure they don't abandon, and we will give them the minimal therapy needed not to create toxicity. And then the second tier will be in between. This will not only save more children around the world, and it, I think it will help us better understand. We all feel that we are over-treating our patient in many countries of this area, but definitely in the West, but everybody is so scared to cut down on treatment. So I think when we do this one protocol adjusted to the countries, we will learn a lot about the genetics of the region, about the tolerance of the kids in that region, and we will learn more about how to improve treatment on our patient, even in the West and in Europe. Um, so this just shows that access is important, diagnosis, treatment, supportive care, outcome, and then we need to work on policies and partnership. And while we're doing all this, it's very important to continue to monitor quality. Quality improvement is very important, and we, our improvement goal will be to take the indicator from tier one to two to three, as I mentioned, 
therefore will be a black belt. And you know, some center might stay at tier two and it will be okay, but they will do the job and the care that a tier two should be doing. And all those uh, levels of care will be assessed with a very specific metric. And we have a whole group at St. Jude that's really expert in doing that because we don't want to be estimating that, oh, I like you and you look like you're doing a good job. So everybody will be really be judged based, based on metrics so that they can, we can provide them with the better feed, uh, feedback to help them more. Research is very important, so this is why the St. Jude Global, and remember St. Jude Global includes you, will be working with our cancer, so to make sure that we are aligned with St. Jude. So the summary is, there is the part of education, and the education is both on-site, so some people will come to St. Jude to be trained, and then it's also regional, so there will be centers in the region where St. Jude will give scholarship for people from the region, this is fellows, nursing, uh, specialty care like limb salvage, and they will go to centers they choose, but we will follow them and we will ask them to sit for specific tests and give them some certificate because they need to have standards that are St. Jude Global standards. And then there will be distance learning, so you all know Cure for Kids, but we are working on courses that are structured and on courses that the trainees will go and sit and pass tests so that they are given credit for the education that they did. Patient-centered care is very important, and the idea of all this training is to send the task force, those St. Jude scholars, back to their region so that they can take better care of their patient. And of course, there will be research that will go from the research of epidemiology all the way to the research of biobanking to know the differences in genetics between the region and to do really more sophisticated research. Uh, in order to oversee all this, there will be a St. Jude Global Board, and this will be the faculty in global medicine along with ALSAC. Also, and you see this at the higher level at St. Jude, not higher, the uh, upper level, St. Jude Global. In the St. Jude Global Alliance, there will be a steering committee so that they can organize among the region. So all the medical directors will work together so all the region uh, have a comparative uh, uh, expectations and outcomes. And also every area will have as a regional steering committee. So China has one now, you within POEM have one, but we will organize it more so you are aligned with St. Jude and there are people from St. Jude that is incorporated within the POEM steering committee. So why is this important? It's not only important for our daily life and the daily cure of cancer. You all have seen this picture, and this is ongoing now, uh, what's happening in Syria. And if you look at what's happening in Syria and Iraq, the kids that are suffering a lot, but we will focus on the one with cancer that are displaced and make the math, we estimate that about every year there's about 2,000 new diagnoses of children with cancer that are dispersed and displaced across the region. So first of all, we don't know where those kids are. Second, who will rebuild the system? Who will rebuild Iraq? Who will rebuild Syria when the war is over? So if you go to the UN website, you will see that Lebanon in the Middle East has the highest burden of refugee, almost over one third of the population. Jordan has the next highest burden. Turkey has two million, which is um, almost as much as Lebanon has, but the difference is compared to the population of Turkey, 3% of the population. So the next step is we are forming a task force, regional task force, to approach this problem. It will be formed by St. Jude and uh, people uh, from the countries involved, both as hosts and uh, as affected by the war. So there will be uh, Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Turkey. And we will work together to form a registry for all those kids, how much their cost is, what, what uh, the outcome is. And this way, when those kids move from one country to the other, they are in the registry, and their data can move with them, and we can follow their outcome. 
Uh, this is a unique approach, is very ambitious, and we are counting on a lot of you in the room to help us do it. But if we succeed, because when we presented it to the board and they said, wow, this is very ambitious, and we said, if St. Jude cannot do it, who can do it? So they are supporting us with it. And the idea is to have a model on how to interfere when there is a human-made or a natural crisis. So for instance, if we have partner in Thailand and there is a tsunami, we will reach our network in order to approach the crisis and help the children with cancer. So this is my last slide. Basically, in the next 10 years, we hope that all the children with cancer will have access to quality care, that we will have models and uh, quality assessment to follow what we are doing, and that we would have trained like uh, St. Jude global leaders that are in the region and they are uh, uh, continuing the mission of what we want to do, and we have given the tools for program growth and development, and have an infrastructure for sustained growth. We don't want to come help and then leave. And hopefully, that access to, to good care will be available to all children, because equality is not what we really want. We want equity. We want all the kids to have access to at least the minimum amount of care and the chance of a cure. Uh, this is so far who is at St. Jude Global working on this, and the list is expanding. So this is not just me. Uh, we are taking this very seriously and want to make it work. And I think when I come next year, this list would have doubled. So I want to send uh, to uh, thank all the people that are listed on the slide. Uh, and this is my email and the site for St. Jude if you are interested in more information. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, uh, what I'll be doing uh, over uh, the next few minutes is discussing the establishment of a cancer center and what it takes. In particular, I'll be discussing models from developed countries and uh, uh, models from the countries with low and uh, for the low and middle income. Now, it's very important that the center dealing with pediatric cancer have the staff and facility to offer treatments that are consistent with current standard of care. And it doesn't really matter where these are. Now, this is important because, as you've heard today, pediatric cancer is rare, and therefore there have to be special centers and dedicated specialists to take care of these children and adolescents in order to achieve optimal results. Now, as I said, I'll be discussing quality standards for the U.S., mainly those developed by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and these have been published in 2014, and from the U.K., from the National Institute for Care Excellence, which is an excellent monograph also published in 2014, and then I'll be talking about countries with limited resources. Now, fortunately, regardless where you are in the world, and regardless of the slight different pattern of pediatric cancers, they are pretty much the same. Leukemias and lymphomas predominate early on in adolescents. Other uh, tumors, uh, particularly bone, bone tumors, become prevalent, and you have a constant stream of uh, soft uh, tissue uh, sarcomas. So fortunately, we can adopt guidelines that transfer from one place to the other for the most part. Now, these are the U.S. guidelines, and I don't want you to go through all of them. I've kept them here because this is uh, part of a project I'm currently involved with. But the most important is that care and coordination should be taken upon in the U.S. by a board-certified pediatric hematologist oncologist or a team of board-certified pediatric hematologist oncologists. Board certification is not achieved everywhere, but there has to be a way to measure competence. Now, next and most important is to have a cadre of well-trained pediatric oncology nurses who are familiar with the protocols and uh, the toxicities. And the American uh, Pediatric Hematology Oncology Nursing uh, Society has a certification process. And I have to say, most of our nurses at uh, CCCL are certified. We need to have 
uh, radiologists, pediatric surgeons, surgical specialists with pediatric expertise, orthopedics, neurosurgery, ophthalmology, otolaryngology, GYN, and so on. Pediatric dentists, pediatric radiation oncologists, either be available in the center or with access, pediatric pathologists with expertise in the three kinds of tumors we deal with most, soft uh, 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 sarcomas, uh, solid tumors, uh, uh, CNS tumors and hematologic malignancies. And then, most importantly, pediatric subspecialists in anesthesia, GI, intensive care, infectious disease, and so on. As social workers, nutrition experts, dedicated pharmacists, and physical and mental rehab services. All of these are very important if we have to have a standard uh, first world cancer center. Now, this is as far as personnel. What about facilities? Uh, needless to say, most of us pediatric oncologists will only feel comfortable if we had a very good intensivist, Dr. Majdalani. And this is the first criteria in the uh, uh, guidelines by the American Academy of Pediatrics is that there has to be an immediately accessible, on-site, fully staffed pediatric intensive care unit. Up-to-date diagnostic imaging facilities, uh, radiation therapy equipment should be available, hematopathology laboratory, access to hemodialysis, apheresis, and hemofiltration, uh, and appropriate isolation uh, facilities. And I am glad to say that these are all available at CCCL here. What about the capabilities? Again, the capabilities have been well defined in the US. Clinical and laboratory capabilities, blood bank pharmacy. But I've highlighted a few. The ability to function as the medical home incorporating anticipatory guidance for these uh, children.